The wind is indeed a useful element all over this world. One thing is certain, when all the reserves of fuel like coal and oil have been used up, there'll still be the wind. You see, the winds which blow around this planet remain largely untapped, a huge and constant source of energy for a power-hungry world. So, with the right engineering skills, due care for the environment and, of course, the will, wind power may once again prove to be a significant and benign source of energy. Please, on your feet, for David Bellamy. Now, I've never really grown up, and wow is my favourite word. And I, whenever I go wow in certain places, I get um, told that I am politically incorrect. Not long ago, I was uh, talking to the press about London, where I was born and lived for 27 years, and I said, you know, it's a most amazing place. I always travel on the underground. And, um, you know, there is a multicultural, um, wonderful group of people. And they're either going to work or they're going to play. And they try to make a living out of this amazing um, uh, metropolis. And I don't see people knifing themselves. So why do we always get the bad news? I think if you can turn around and, you know, um, the great thing about travelling on the underground is when it uh, comes to a halt, you, will, you don't fall over because you're all so squashed in. And it's a wonderful, wonderful place. Now, I... Ooh, where are we? Yeah. Um, <coughs> now, I just put a few of the letters after my name on this thing. I've got about 35 different ones. And in the height of my popularity, every university all the way around the world, used to give me honorary doctorates, and I've got these yards and yards. I gave up doing it recently because we've got some really funny universities these days, and um, I don't, not, don't quite know what they do. I got my own bottle of water. It is not my um, computer, squirt, squirt. <laughs> so let's get on with it. When moving around London, I liked, oh, I'm going to say, next slide because that's how I was thinking. I don't understand these, so I have to say, next slide and someone will do it, but don't get, go there yet, right? When moving around London, I like to travel on the underground. I call it my tube, because lots of people still like to chat with the man who they used to see on telly before he stopped his first wind farm on Blue Peter. I didn't really mean to do that, but it didn't half stop, and it start, started stirring up a lot. And I do wonder... Is it that the Teletubbies um, advertise wind turbines every time they put it on? Boop, 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 and they fall around this wind turbine going around. Subliminally, of course. And I'd love to know who actually put and why they put that um, wind turbine up there. Uh, next slide, please. Now, over the recent months as I travelled the tube, um, we talk about lots and lots of things, but... Recently, it's all been about wind turbines and um, spiced with the fact that in a bid to earn greenie points, Marks and Spencers announced a plan to source all its electricity from renewables. Wow. The next step, NPower, which is a beloved um, thing by Greenpeace. Uh, they absolutely love it, despite the fact not only they make... Um, uh, wind farm, but they also do all the, um, the uh, nuclear power. Um, and so uh, Marks and Sparks were going to get all their stuff on renewables. Um, now, a quick sum showed that this would be about a third of the entire current annual output of Britain's 2,400 wind turbines. Fine. just to keep Mark uh, knickers up. <laughs> Next slide. Oh, no, no, we've got it. That uh, Marks and Sparks. I'll show you something if you like. <laughs> um, 
So what about the other green customers that have been led to believe that they are paying premium prices for supplies from the same pool of alternatives? Let alone the ordinary customer who often admits is also paying an annual premium to help finance the same green electricity. As I say, a great way for Marks and Smiths and Sparks to greenwash their underpants unless end power is providing lots more new pylons and overhead wires to facilitate dedicated hookups, which they can't do and they don't do. So how happy are their customers when they find out that in reality their lean green electricity is mixed with 95% of juice made up of dirty carbon and nuclear, thanks to the fact that it all comes out through the same grid. And it doesn't that do that grid very much good because it fluctuates the whole time. Now, of course, the same is taught as true for RSPB, that's Royal Society of Protection of Bird Energy, whose large flock of fundraisers, 102 of them, are crowing about in their latest advert. What a total scam. Now, surely that tells us that our people um, in charge of this country get so many uh, ideas wrong that we can just shut up and go home or get on living in a better way. The next slide, please. To cap it all, the brown job. Um, in his guise as Capability Green, has announced that part of his plan to solve both the carbon and the credit crunch Britain will create lots and lots of jobs by manufacturing and subsidising the use of electric cars. The next slide, please. And there's one of them. Doesn't his advisers know that they will all depend on plugging into the same national grid? <laughs> Yet this man stood up and said, that's how I'm going to solve these problems. I didn't hear of any mo very mo many moans or anything. We are being lied to the whole time. Next slide, please. Now, with spin like that, there's little wonder that thousands of communities across Britain, Europe and the world are being torn asunder by wind-driven, uncivil wars as long-term neighbours and friends find themselves on different um, sides of a bitter cash flow argument. Now, we're surrounded. They are going up all the time. But there is some good news. In fact, the only good news about wind turbines is that the tide is beginning to turn very rapidly. Investment in these high-rise weapons of mass economic and social destruction has dropped dramatically, while the wind industry has just accused the government of sabotage over a proposed fourfold tax increase that could lead to the scrapping of up a half of Britain's 150 um, onshore projects. Wow! <laughs> Was that all over the paper? Did the BBC tell? Did they hell? They held those facts back. Next slide, please. So, back to the drawing board and the underground. I really do like the underground. Um, the sustainability of the underground's en en engineering heritage is second to none in the annals of public transport. And at night, its tunnels provided a safe night's sleep for my family and many others during the Blitz in London. We went down the underground and slept on the thing. And we always wondered, what, as kids, what would happen if a train came through where we were actually lying on the rails, but it never actually did. <laughs> Today, its cultural diversity is immense. People of, e people of every creed and kind, backed by the economy the economics of the oyster dance, and see when they go through and put their oyster cards and get, ooh, wow, fantastic stuff, um, are doing their best to travel to work or play below an amazing diversity of real estate. And quite a lot of that is empty and really that the looking and putting back into some sort of order before we start building and covering more and more of the green space we've got with um, useless um, buildings. Homo sapiens var at urbanicus, living at a density of around 5,000 people per square metre across Greater London, while doing their best to make a living from this fossil fuel metro metro 
metropolis, a city paved with gold, uh, with gold for some and hope for all would be Boris Whittington, Whittington. And you've seen him parading around. Could he really help us if he came on our side? I don't know. But why we, are we really um, here today? The next slide. Call it creation or evolution, we are here because the gravitational forces that made Isaac Newton sit up and think. It was a big apple that fell on his hand, about that big. We've got some of them, not the original one, but we found out what they look like. Um, and the sunspot and the moving sunspot that nearly got Galileo recycled as biomass governs the shape and the form of this universe. Once relieved, released from the crushing bondage of a granddaddy of a black hole by a big bang, these forces gave order to the universe that contained our lonely planet. Well, it was lonely. Indeed, it was dead until carbon found itself in orbit around the sun that regulates the Earth's heating and cooling system. Nothing else does it. It's the sun. Despite the fact that this, our spaceship, um, hurtled around the solar system at a speed of about 108,000 kilometres an hour, and its crust is made of slightly acidic aluminium silicate, a poison. We have to call it home because it's the only one we've got and we should be looking after it and we should be telling all the kids in this world we live in a wonderful world and if you look after it, it's going to go on being wonderful for a long, long time. Next slide. <laughs> Just to show how I... There were three generations of the kids who've never seen David Bellamy on Blue Peter but I still go around and talk to lots of kids. And I had about a 1,000 primary school kids, and all their teachers said, oh, we grew up on television with David Bellamy, and they showed pictures of things. And in the, um, the question time, a little girl put her hand up, and she said, are you the voice on the Ribena advert? <laughs> I say four words on that advert, and I said yes. And she said, what made you say four so famous, that it will pay you lots of money to do that advert. What's wrong with our um, education system at down, down there at that thing? Absolutely wonderful. Next slide, please. The only reason we and the rest of life can thrive here is because the temperature range at the surface of that oblate spheroid allows water, the universal catalyst, and the main... Um, greenhouse gas and thousands of kids at this moment are filling the tick boxes on, on GCE and they have to put um, carbon dioxide. It isn't. They have to lie every time they tick that tick box and if they don't put, and if they had the audacity to put um, uh, water vapour then they would lose that point. Um, from that point onwards um, natural history, or in modern speech, biodiversity had to happen. I like the first term because it's dynamic, describing an ever-changing process. But as the latter is now politically correct, I and you are gagged with it. What a useless term, biodiversity. I'll tell you why. Next slide, please. The most biodiverse bit of London happens to be Kew Gardens. And... Its only drawback is that lots of fossil fuel has to be burned to maintain its environment status quo. That is warm, damp, and shady enough to bring on the flowers and the tourist smiles. I must say miles these days, I say. Tourist smiles, but not miles, because people damn well have to get there. And I hope not they go on um, getting there. If that source of energy was shut off, Slowly but surely, the whole area would revert to a range of temperate estuarine wetlands, scrubland and woodlands, as would the majority of the London Basin. And we do have to remember that the London Basin is starting rising up after the effect of um, uh, global warming. Hooray, hooray. If it hadn't, we didn't be in, the, in real problems. Next slide, please. Now, each... Each one of these um, 
ecosystems, and we don't use that term anymore, uh, is buzzing with its own brand of natural history, programmed by landform and the prevailing state of the cycles of natural climate change. They're there, and they are uh, holding the thing in um, some form of kilter. With all this um, uh, uh, recent talk about fuel security, are you all really sitting comfortably? Do you understand what that is and who is actually organising it? If we'd been here just in the, anywhere in Britain a mere 10,000 years ago, caves would have been at a premium and any real estate um, battle would have been fought using state-of-the-art chips made of flint, not of anything else. Very interesting, about two weeks ago, no, about a month ago, they found that people had been building houses in Scotland 14,000 years ago. How the hell they did it? I don't know, because most of that was under ice, but the proof is there, and they were butchering um, uh, reindeer, um, giant elk, and all sorts of wonderful things. And I was talking to a, um, a, a building um, uh, firm, and all I could do was talk about that, and they didn't think it was very funny. The next slide. The last ice age was drawing to a close thanks to wobbly orbits and warmer faces, uh, phases of sun cycles. These were doing their best to remove the burden of ice off the land and refill the English Channel, thus providing Britain with the privileges and the problems of island status. Say it hadn't have filled up again. We'd have been part of Europe years ago, where we were before that. Thank God it did come and fill the thing up. <laughs> the next slide. Now, all these slides, I once went from the North Pole all the way down um, into... Um, America, making a film called Bellamy's New World. And I took these pictures to show what the whole of Britain was like as it came out of the um, last, or was it, Ice Age. And we hadn't the faintest idea whether it was or not. Glaciers began to melt in earnest and life began to appear in the meltwater. Now, this is all fact. Fact which have been looked at time and time and time again in peer-reviewed journals. The BBC don't take any of this as any fact at all. You have to have models made on computers. The next slide, please. And this was the first carbon footprint on those eyes. It's called Chlamydomonas nivea. Now, anyone who did biology at O level when, uh, well, it was a trick when I did it a long time ago, would know about Chlamydomonas. It's a wonderful little round um, cell. Uh, really, it's a plant, but it hadn't quite made up its mind. It can swim, it can have sex. And living up there on the, um, on the pristine uh, snow cover, it has to protect itself with a red pigment because as nascent hydrogen um, is produced, in fact, as chlorophyll is being formed, and if it gets too much UV, then it just doesn't get formed. And as these things, therefore, because darker, it melts the snow, and you get these little tiny footprints, each one with tens of thousands of these wonderful, jolly little Chlamydomonas nivea. Next slide, please. No, no, back one. That's it. Now, this is actually just round the corner, or Hatton just round the corner, where I live up on top of the Pennines. Two, um, two um, glaciers, one which was coming down from Teesdale, and the other one which had come all the way round across Shap Fell, round across the, um, the motorway, and they bumped in together at this point. And as they bumped in together, they pushed an enormous... Um, lump of ice down into the thing to form a kettle hole. And we have looked in that, and we've got a complete um, uh, pollen record of everything which happened 
in about the last 7,000 years. And we've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those. And we know how much the temperature went up, well, relatively, and how much the other things changed. But during the formation of, um, of glaciers, it was very, very dry. Do you remember 17,500 years ago, if we'd have been in um, the Amazon, there was no Amazon forest there at all. It was very, very dry during um, the time we were having the Ice Age. And at some point, all the people, there were a million people probably living there, suddenly said, where the hell are all these um, uh, uh, trees coming from? And there wasn't a David Bellamy to tell them, because I, you know, and they had to put up with that and change their whole way of life. And again, we don't teach these things anymore at school. That is left out um, uh, very, very well. I'm, I'm sure it's not be in, you know, because they don't want them to know that there's so much of a trap that you make them learn these all sorts of matter, they, that um, you know, it just doesn't get in. So all these winds deposited lots of nasty, dirty um, uh, dust. Do you remember um, Snoopy when he said, never, when you're skiing, never eat yellow snow. <laughs> well, when you go anywhere in Europe and there's lots of yellow snow and yellow makes the thing, makes the, um, the, the, the thing melt quicker and black dust as well. And if you go up into the two or three cantons where they don't have um, cars going back and forth, pouring out and lorries pouring out um, particular diesel, the blooming things are not melting. And do remember it wasn't very long ago that they found the Ice Man. And this Ice Man had suddenly popped out of the, um, of the melting uh, thing, and there he was. And everyone took him home and sort of found out what he was. And um, that meant that he must have been going along somewhere, hunting, and then he died up went the snow, and then uh, because of natural cycles of um, warmth, um, out he popped again. And that all over the time, wherever we look, and in the old days it used to be, you know, it would be in the papers and things. We don't get those things in the papers, not as regularly as we used to. Um, so here we've got two um, enormous glaciers pushing themselves down. And next slide, please. Now, the main problem which held up evolution or held up development was the fact that nitrogen um, is very, very soluble. So despite there was quite a lot of nitrogen there, and as the melting of the ice went on, it all got washed away. So the process of recovering of the landscapes would have taken much, much longer but for the fact, and you see here, there is two pools, little tiny um, uh, pools, and round the, well, that is that black is another alga, a blue-green alga. And this amazing alga can actually fit, not only do photosynthesize, which is very clever, but also can fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. So they were pumping in the, the, the most important um, resource they actually needed. And from that point onwards, as good old hooray for global warming, um, as the temperature went out and the permafrost began to melt, there was everything and it was all systems go to cover the land very, very rapidly with um, plants. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Right. <coughs> The only problem was the wind was still very, very dry, and so the only place other plants could get um, their, their roots down there was uh, where there was some form of a shelter. And these are the famous um, stone stripes. And down just a little depression, the melting went uh, very fast. And here are six species of mosses beginning to grow. And you remember, the mosses were the first 
land plant ever to be stupid enough to stick their head up above the water. And they've been there for 475 million years, a long, long time ago. Um, the next slide. Next slide, please. Right, now these I love, these are ice wedge polygons, and you can fly across much of, of, um, of northern Canada, and there this wonderful patterning underneath, and it's because as it melts and goes, and it does melt every summer, it melts a bit and then it freezes again. And we all get out there and we have a, people going out and saying, my God, it's um, global warming, going to melt all things, come back. I mean, the whole summer lasts about 10 days, but when you get there, you get your feet wet. You say, oh my God, it's all, wet, all melting away. Um, and if you look around each one of these ice wedge polygons, you'll see that black line, which is the blue-green alga, fixing the nitrogen, and the plants um, following on very, very rapidly. Next slide, please. Very, very soon, the terrain was um, rich enough to actually su start to support lots of animals, and quite large animals. And uh, here is a kill which was made uh, a long, long time ago. Um, and round it, because of the nutrient which has, has come out of the dead animal, there are now nine species of moss and three species of flowering plant, beginning to make soil. So as soon as global warming, natural climate change, what you enjoy, it got better and better and better. And we've got to remember that in those 10,000 years, um, most of the civilizations of the world developed. Now, what the hell would have happened if um, climate change hadn't warmed it up? We'd still be in a pretty bad state down there, but it didn't, so I always say thank God for global warming, um, but the natural stuff, not BBC Mark One stuff, next time. <laughs> and here's absolutely wonderful, because now most of the, um, uh, the, uh, the frozen grounds has gone, and you can see the trees starting to come in and grow round the edges of those ice wedge polygons. And here we've got it. The whole landscape is being gobbled up by plants and even by trees. And it wasn't long after um, the melting started that the trees were actually growing. Next slide, please. Until we find that the whole, and the whole of Britain 8,000 years ago would have been covered with deciduous old growth forests. It must have been the most boring, bloody place to try and live anywhere. I'd have loved to have seen it, don't get me wrong, old growth forest. But how could anyone do anything in it? And thank goodness, a, um, a wandering uh, farmers turned up on the scene with, um, and they were stuck until they could actually find a stone which they could polish and turn into axes. The next slide, please. And here is the first Neolithic farm. I couldn't find a real one, so that. Um, and this is, I took a group of Boy Scouts about 35 years ago to Spain, and we looked at the vegetation going from right under the sea, right to the top of the sea of Cabrera. And when we got to this tiny little village, it was, had not changed at all since medieval times. And there was two blind ladies in the, um, in the, the, the village, and their job was to strip elm leaves off every year to feed the animals. We thought that had all disappeared, and we went in, and we actually saw it going. And thank goodness we got there just in time. They were about to chop down the last bit of this forest, and the Boy Scouts were all lined up, dib, 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 dob, 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 and we stopped it but it wasn't that easy. But the next time we went back, television was there in a big way. Probably they could blame it because they had copies of my damn film I made of it, and off they went. The next slide, please. Oh. 
Now, anyone who knows the Lake, Lake District, uh, you should know that's the Langdale Pikes. And it was the Land, Langdale Pikes where um, they found a, a rock formation which they could polish and turn into um, axes. And these axes were then flogged all the way around Northern Europe. And they were the things which allowed the Neolithic farmers to chop down the um, elm trees and also the oak trees. And wow, they put biodiversity in it. And if you think about it, all the fields, all the wetlands, and most of the other things which we say is the British landscape, a landscape which, uh, which um, uh, uh, I'm losing myself, hang on. <laughs> yes, a landscape which Winston Churchill said was worth dying for. You go, I can remember him, I sat with a cat's whisker um, in, um, at home it, during the war, and we heard that great man saying all those amazing, amazing things. A landscape which is worth dying for. And when he was actually in charge of checkers, he revamped um, the whole of the checkers' main garden to attract but butterflies and bees and things. And I'll be told that in the history, the history that we get from is all the bad stuff, never the good stuff. The next slide, please. There's the axis, and uh, even that. It didn't take very, very long. In fact, scientists have made the axis again and seen how long it would take to chop a tree down. Next slide. Now, when the Romans sailed up to the Thames and founded Londinium, there was little left of Britain's ancient forest, even north of the Hadrian Wall. They went through it. They were, you know, and there was probably very, very little of old growth forest left anywhere, um, you know, by the time the, um, the Romans got there. Um, next slide. And that was the same Hadrian who banned mixed bathing in the sumptuous baths built in what then became the city of London. Do you remember they found it about 15 years ago and this wonderful place where um, he banned mixed bathing because rude things were happening. And what did we do? We turned it into a bloody high-rise parking lot. Why didn't we open a bottle and see how... <laughs> And also, by that time, they were doing good red wine on the Scottish borders. And the temperature must have been three degrees warmer than it is now. And we've got all these records, and all the ones which Al Gore and show, so, you know, all the real ones go down. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the next slide, please. Now, the medieval warm period saw the golden days of European organic uh, agriculture. The growing world population could be fed and civilization flourished, creating, creating some of the world's greatest built -it buildings, uh, sculpture and music. I remember walking with my um, eldest grandson through, um, uh, where was it? Well, it was in Italy, and he was going to and we were showing you all these beautiful buildings. And he said, you know, Granddad, if we hadn't have built those things, we wouldn't have to write so much money looking after them. <laughs> Which I think that was pretty terrible. And Granddad had to, I didn't hit him, but I felt like it. <laughs> uh, and we also got to remember that at that time, the Vikings had colonised the ice-free margins of Greenland, farming cereals, sheep and beef, but not for long. The temperature has dropped again, heralding the Little Ice Age, which lasted for a long time. Next slide, please. As the temperature eased downwards, crops failed and thousands and thousands died of malaria. They called it ague in those days, but it was malaria. A de disease, and note this, 
which was endemic throughout Europe and way up into Siberia. So how the hell can, um, can the global warmers say, oh, we're all going to die of, of um, uh, the global warming because we're all going to get um, malaria? It's lies. It's whole pages and pages and pages of lies. So what was happening there, you know, people were not, you know, they were bad crops right the way throughout the Little Ice Age, and people just didn't have enough to eat, so they succumbed to the ague. You know, it's not really a killer, well, some strains are killers, but um, they just didn't have enough food, and when you don't have enough food or the right, as we were shown yesterday, and that wonderful thing about the changing of our food these days, they began to die. The next slide. Oh, no. Yep, next slide. Can you go back one? Can you go back one? Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. The only thing that then brought some cheer into a very, very cold Europe and very, very cold, much colder world in some ways were the ice fairs on uh, London. This was a picture of the last one. This was the coming into the end of the Little Ice Age and things were beginning to warm up again. And do remember, 1850 was the time it started warming up and that's where all the global warmers start their gas from not earlier at all. So they miss out the hump. The next slide, please. Now, corroborative proof of much of this sequence I've been talking about of landscape and natural climate change came by accident while building a bypass around Darlington. And we were called in there because one of their big dog diggers had disappeared down a hole and it was an old kettle hole. And we climbed into this, we got blaster baits in, and he just put a charge of dynamite and blew the thing back out, and it stood on the side again. That was good fun. But then we looked at this, and there was a complete, well, not a complete record, but all these um, changes. And at the bottom, I could pick up handfuls of those five mosses which started the process off 10,000 years ago. And people say, oh, no, no, you've got to prove it with a, you know, ah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, now, how, so the record was preserved by the peat, backed up by many other base, peat-based sequences, studied across Britain, across Europe, and across in parts of the world. And they show that climate change was the culprit. And it was nothing else but change. Now, how can I say, dare to say that, when the media is still making a meal of Al Gore's predictions of a melting world, let alone an Oscar and a Nobel Bio Prize? How did they ever give Henry Kissinger a Nobel Prize? How the hell did they give Al Gore a Nobel Prize? But they got it. And um, they're still going around the bar talking about it. Next slide, please. Well, here's the temperature at Revel, uh, the real record. There's the medieval warm period, then into the Ice Age, up and down, and we're still not back to the medieval warm period. And we're wobbling around like the clappers. So how can we say that um, carbon dioxide is in the driving seat? The next slide, please. And how about this one? Peer reviewed many times. Here is the shortening, the melting of our glaciers. And you see it starts, um, here we're coming out of the, um, uh, of, of the Little Ice Age, down uh, and then back. And the trend of melting had not changed at all. Despite that we're pumping CO2 into the atmosphere, the actual trend doesn't change. So how can carbon be the driving force? It can't be the driving force. Next slide, please. Now, 
Here is Al Gore's famous hockey stick. And we've all seen it. We've even seen David Attenborough with his own hockey stick hobbling about the thing saying, oh, it's all because of global warming. I don't know why he ever said that. He used to be a, on our side, but he changed for some totally unknown reason at the same time that he pushed for an enormous wind turbine on Glyndebourne. And why did he want a thing? Because every uh, place that you have a, you know, an opera, they like to be the best in the world. And he could do Don Quixote. Clever stuff, isn't it? With the bloody wind. Well, they could turn it off, couldn't they? But there is the hockey stick. And now let's look at the actual figures. I'll get you... Oh. This, the real official data from the Met Office Hadley Institute, no less, recalled a very different picture. Next slide, please. A flaccid hockey stick that needs a bloody good dose of Viagra. <laughs> no wonder, and we weren't told this by the BBC, but no wonder that after its statistical invalidity had been exposed to the world, the Internet, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change strategically moved it out of public view. It disappeared from that big thing, and they haven't talked about it yet. Yet, next slide, David Miliband, one of the terrible twins, ordered that copies of all Al Gore's shockaholic movie the backbone of which is the discredited hockey stick, should be given to all secondary schools. Wow. Another inconvenient truth arrived when a British High Court judge ruled that as five of the claims made in the film were so scientifically absurd that the government would be in breach of a law against the teaching of propaganda in schools. And unless <laughs> the film was accompanied by counterweight material correcting its errors. There were 25 lies in there, but the High Court didn't really, uh, well, five will do. The only problem was that nobody told the teaching profession of this law. And that, uh, I wonder how many teachers there are who could be going to prison because of going against that law, but they weren't actually told. So, there we are. Next slide. This one I like a lot. Isn't that a lovely... I worked in the High Arctic, and while we worked in the High Arctic, we were trying to stop the Inuits from actually just shooting polar bears willy-nilly. And um, because all they could do was sell the heads and the pelt. And they all agreed that they would only shoot one every year, but they could sell that one shot to a rich American shootist for $60,000. The numbers of things went up and up and up and up, whatever um, the BBC says. There are now more um, polar bears in um, the world than there were 30 years ago. Right? And we've been lying. Now, this one... And there is a husky dog, and it's chained down. The polar bear's not chained down. But this, one of the things I had to do was help the conservationists when I worked out there, to, uh, because all the polar bears used to come down and eat the fat out of the chip um, pan. And you couldn't stop them going in there. They're very nasty things, the polar, polar bears. <laughs> and, <coughs> and then we um, put a, a dose of... Uh, tranquilizer and to move it back 30 miles and two days later they came back again but we had to do that they had to thank god by law you can't shoot the thing but there's one place where the numbers are going down there are four places where um, they're not changing at all and there's one place where they're going up and they're even thinking of culling they won't because they now made it an endangered species which it isn't the next slide, please. <laughs> right. Now, this is the proof. This is all the proof you need. 
I am 76 years of age. When I see that picture, my temperature goes up, <laughs> followed by the amount of CO2 I breathe out. <laughs> I can go home, that's it. That's all the proof we need. It cannot possibly be. Next slide, please. And all the ice cores that have ever been looked at um, in the last, what, 15, 20 years show exactly the same. Up goes CO2. No, it doesn't. Up goes the temperature, followed by CO2. Good old Marilyn Munro. Thank you. The next slide, please. Yes, Quadivac de demonstrandum, firm scientific evidence that carbon dioxide cannot be in the driving seat. Indeed, if we wanted to double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, uh, double it from uh, pre-industrial days, the world would have to burn all its known oil reserves, all its known gas reserves, and a third of all its known coal. And even if we cloned Arthur Scargill, we couldn't do that. <laughs> we really couldn't. We just couldn't put that. And that would raise the temperature by 0.2 of a degree centigrade. So what the hell are we worrying about? And e even with the USA working as usual and China and India going flat out, it would be a daunting thing. And I don't think we're going to do it anyway. Next slide. So we're back to my... Oh, no, very dumb as you've seen it already. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing that the paper which I produced with my students uh, from that catalogue was um, actually uh, published, peer-reviewed, in 1966, just as we were beginning to be warned of a catastrophic ice age was going to kill us all. Remember that? Up into the 70s. Such a scenario had been talked about on a number of times before, and many students counsel that the Earth is in an interstadial, another wobble, not a full-blown interglacial. That is why I, in those days I worked with Greenpeace and campaigned with, along with the FOE to get the e uh, government to insulate the loss of pet pensioners in London to protect them for few from um, hypothermia and fuel uh, poverty we were talking about in those days. Then as the world temperature started on an upward trend of a mere 0.7 degrees um, Celsius, some of the same global warmers set their research budgets on regular go global warming, and that's where they are still stuck. So if you have any difficulty following the, green, the current green directives of all our three politi political parties, join the club, because they don't understand, and we don't understand, and you don't understand. Next slide, please. No, no, keep it. <laughs> Take the wonderful case of biodiesel. To add mass global inju injury to I insult of all the basic tenets of nature conservation that I used to talk about in the old days, the recent ill research push for a carbon neutral, whatever that means, we are each made of four. 47% uh, of us is carbon. If we took it all away, we'd fall down a heap in the floor. But, um, uh, whatever that means, an, a biodiesel-based garden of Eden, let alone the rush for carbon credits, or are they just 21st century indulgences in electronic guise, is madness indeed. Many of these schemes simply allow the rich world to carry on polluting the atmosphere with real killer gases, oxide of sulphur and nitrogen and particulate diesel, while causing starvation on a massive scale and trashing biodiversity as they gobble up more sustainable lifestyles. And this is happening all the way across the world. Borneo has gone. All those regrowth forests full of orangutans are now being bulldozed, burnt, and they're putting it biodiesel. And we can't stop them. 
I've got a project we're working with in Brunei, putting a, um, a billion trees in. But they're bulldozing them in a quick input in. Who are these people are allowed to do this? Our politicians are allowed to do WWF are doing very, very little about this. Thank God they have now um, got onto the fact that biodiesel is a pretty stupid idea. Next slide. Right. Uh, um, since no Norway led the way into the taxation of carbon, its output of carbon dioxide has risen by 12%. What a waste of the taxpayers' hard-earned money. Biofuels essentially take food from hungry mouths and put it into cars. The grain required to fill a tank of a SUV with ethanol is enough to feed one African for a whole year. 30% of this year's corn production in the United States will be burned up on America's highways, despite the fact they've reduced the size of their cars pretty dramatically. A fact made possible only through subsidies that globally will total 51 billion this year alone. So why are we allowing it to happen? All adding to the continuing destruction of the world's natural living soils and the overfishing of the world's fish stocks that help feed humanity and help keep the world's environment in some sort of sustainable working order. These are the real crimes about, against humanity, for they trash the biodiversity upon we and the balance of the biosphere depend. And without putting that back into working order, we have actually had it. Next slide, please. With an increasing number of people trying to make a living from this planet, just think of the problems of providing the required 19 uh, billion healthful meals every day, let alone all the washing up water and toilet paper that goes with them. I wrote a book called Poo, You and the Potheroo's Loo for Kids. <laughs> and we all sat down and we worked out if we all... we all asked each other, how many sheets do we use every other time we go to the loo? And some of them think they're about 36. <laughs> but, um, so we got an average. And the, uh, if everyone in the world used toilet paper, um, the annual roll would stretch from here to the planet Uranus. God help us if you use 36 every time you go. But kids love that sort of thing, absolutely not. <laughs> um, um, for over a decade, I was president of Population Concern, an NGO that helped facilitate family planning in any developing country that sought our help. The thing that drove us on was that once women had the vote and ac access to the latest reproductive health care, they began to regulate the size of their families. And we must remember that um, it is Italy that led the world into single child families. Because the average Italian man loves children and he knows they can't afford more than one. Has that ever been? And then that's followed by, um, uh, by Russia. But we're all saying, oh, well, it was China did that. Well, thank God China did. But, um, so did a lot of other people. And it was wonderful working in Bangladesh. And women would get down and hold on to our feet and say, don't go away, we're going to get beaten up by our old men. Man, because you know, if there's not another bun in the oven, he doesn't think he's doing what he should do. And they were very, very brave. And we kept... And then what happened, the government... Well, it's not a government, is it? It's a, a anachronism. Um, told us that we couldn't mention um, a population at all because it was far too, um, you know, nasty of us to talk about that. And I had to, um, no, I could tell you a really awful slide, right? It would be, uh, next slide, please. <laughs> right. We must thank our lucky star, the sun, that not long ago, all human aspirations were solar-powered. We must also thank God or Richard Dawkins that humanity is set aside from the rest of biodiversity by one sole attribute, 
the power of conscious thought, knowledge of right or wrong, ethics, soulship, corporate responsibility, call it what you will. We alone can learn from history, be it natural or people made, and put the things of good report into action. Wow! That's why you're here. <laughs> You've got the guts to stand up and say, the time has come to stop. Please, I'm not saying that we all must become subsistence farmers and fishers. Far from it. I'm cautioning that the state of the human-driven world is already facing its most debilitating uh, problems, an increasing population and the biodiversity crunch. We have got to stop the biodiversity crunch. Without a well-planned surface network of natural areas and a well-planned matrix of green corridors for migration, the cost of future management will escalate out of control. That is the problem facing us. And there are very, very good things coming through. Next slide, please. The good news is that every which way I look around the world, I find people fed up at sick and tired that the values and the everyday things their parents and grandparents took for granted are disappearing before their very eyes. The even greater news is they are not just sitting back and expecting that the government will solve it, because they know it won't. But they're working with their local communities to stitch their patch back into more biodiverse and hence more sustainable working order. And it's happening. I could take you and make a good news story from around the world every day. Why aren't people making those? Why are so many of the things that moving wallpaper? They don't talk about any problems at all. And we have got to get the good news over. I call it the multicoloured renaissance, and it makes me optimistic about the future of my children and grandchildren. There are thousands and thousands of working examples of projects around the world, both large and small, which are producing amazingly uh, uh, positive results. What is more, with satellite surveillance, a watch can be kept for any intrusion onto these um, reserves of every type. And those are, that is happening. But of course, there are the other side trying to stop that happening. They can also put the spotlight on other major, major changes in the countryside. It may seem paradoxical, but par apart from becoming the world's biggest emitter of carbon dioxide, the Chinese now lead the same world in the practice of importing waste for recycling, including plastic. The next slide, please. We don't hear that much about the fact that China is undergoing a new agricultural revolution in recycled plastic tunnels. These allow them to make much better use of infrared radiation, water vapour and composed human waste. One reason why simple schemes uh, work so well is the increased level of that much vilified gas CO2 in and the most important greenhouse gas, which is water vapour, inside those tunnels. And they, the, the product is absolutely amazing. Uh, a lot of China is you know, pretty um, on the edge of being um, desert. Um, the same is true out in the open, with the increasing level of CO2 in the atmosphere. Next slide, please. Last year, I was... Um, very honoured to go up the whole length of Africa with drummers and dancers, most of whom were, were either blind or... Thing. And we were celebrating the 200th anniversary of the abolition of slave trading. And it was absolutely phenomenal. And when we got up north of, of um, Burkina Faso, we suddenly found that the... Um, Great chunks of the Sahara dead weren't there. They're covered with trees. 
300,000 square kilometres are covered with trees. Why? Because as the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere goes up, the plants can keep all their little stomachs, they remember stomachs? They can keep them closed so they don't breathe out water vapour, do they? So great chunks of the Sahel where 30 years ago people were dying, all the people are back and using things and there they are. Why aren't we talking about it just about squeezed into new sciences about well, um, 20 years ago, but was immediately scrubbed down? You mustn't have good news in new sciences, must you? Next slide. <coughs> and how... Um, you, don't, you, uh, you, you don't get that much good news about CO2, let alone Africa. This is um, the actual, um, the growth response to a 300 per part per million increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide since it started going up. C3 cereals have production increased by 49%. A C4 by 20, fruit and melon 24, legumes 44, roots and tubers 48. We never told that. In fact, all our damn farmers are getting free aerial um, you know, uh, CO2. And, it, well, of course, you've got to have water and things, but the potential is actually there. And plants are not stupid like human beings. They do keep their mouth shut, except <laughs> some who are called David Bellamy, and you get your teeth down. down. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Right. The World Bank. Ha ha. Now, if only the World Bank really was still backed up by gold, um, probably most of our uh, problems would have gone away. Um, the, in fact, the credit crunchers might have been able to bail themselves out without pinching our money to do it. But at least the World Bank considered at this time, you know, before this, 10 years before, um, the case of the world's forests. According to a recent EU Commission review, the global economy is losing more money from forest crunching than from credit crunching. Next slide. They put the annual cost of forest loss at between two trillion and five trillion based on adding together the value of the various services that water the that the forest actually do. The next slide please. In the next twenty four hours, deforestation alone will trash some of these resources while releasing as much CO2 into the atmosphere as 8 million people flying from Europe to New York. So the easiest way to stop it, um, global warming, if you want to stop it, and if you believe what they say about it, would be stop the loggers. And as soon as we stop the loggers, loggers then we can start putting the ecosystems back into working order. But biodiesel and all these other things are try to beat it before um, we get to that thing. So certainly stopping log is the fastest and cheapest solution to tackle climate disbalance. And if you still can't shake off the fear of carbon instilled into you for the past 30 years, then get the feel-good factor by reducing your own fossil footprints, fossil fuel footprints. I am the adopted grandfather of over 200 walking buses in Kent. And the kids walk to school every day. And last year they say 51,000 journeys. And when we started this, and I didn't start it, I just got annexed, as it were. Um, and when we started in the first year, I said, if I'm coming, we're not going to talk about carbon, we'll talk about fossil fuel footprint. And all the kids work out how much petrol they saved. And some of them saved almost 400 quid 
in petrol. We haven't worked out the shoe leather, but there you are. Uh, we all have to be a little bit on the fiddle. But, um, <laughs> and they love it. But now we have been told by the local authority, oh, we mustn't call it a... Because we had to set up a charity to get rid of the money. The first round, all the kids, what are you going to do with all the money? We want a Ferrari. <laughs> now, how can you bother them? How can you fault them? Because that's all the things actually tell, tell you. You must have big photographs. But now they work this out and they put charity. And the wonderful thing, and as all the walking buses work th walk through the village, all the old people come out. And these people probably don't see their own grandchildren very often because they live somewhere else. And they're now in working in the schools. And a whole new, uh, you know, social h hormone has built, built up. And that is very, but now they say, oh no, you must call it something else. I said, but why not, why not walking buses? People don't understand what walking buses is. I don't understand what, oh, sh oh shut up, Bellamy. Next. <laughs> huh? Next slide, please. And the next one. And the next one, please. Right. For those who would still question my scepticism about man-made global warming, I will remind you of the following facts. As the world got ready to welcome the new millennium in, the Y2 bug scare caused, and note this, tens of thousands of the world's most highly paid and computer literate people to succumb to a mass hysteria that would cost them dearly. 70 days later, another bout of mass hysteria birthed the dot-com bubble with match gap gnashing of golden teeth. Almost a dec decade later, the next real bout of we are doing our best to increase our profitability hysteria crunched the world's credit setting our biggest money lenders all of a Twitter about their New Year bonuses. And look what a hell of a mess that has actually got us. Add to that the fact that despite more and more carbon dioxide has been pouring into the atmosphere over the same decade, the world's temperature has not risen at all. Indeed, over the past two years, the temperature has begun to fall. The main scientific explanation for this is lack of sunspots. If you actually look, we are now into the 24th cycle of sunspots. There have been no sunspots for 18 months. The last time that happened, we went into the Maunder Minimum and the um, Thames shows over. So why aren't these? Why do, when I hear um, the BBC talking about uh, Africa, they say all the African lakes are drying up because of global warming. They're drying up because we're using all the water out of them for growing cut flour for Tesco's or Marks and Sparks, all those things. I mean, uh, the, the biggest boo-boo in uh, the Al Gore film was that he said, uh, which was it, the, um, uh, go on, come back. The Aral Sea had dried up <laughs> because of global warming. Everyone knows that the Aral Sea had dried up because the, the pres great presendium of science of, of all Russia were asked, where shall we grow our, um, our cotton? And it was the perfect place. But it had, for every tonne of cotton, it uses 19 tonnes of water. And that's gone. And now they found, just round the corner, another enormous lake. Nobody knew was there. And all the water's paying that. Why aren't we told that? Why aren't we given the really good news that we should be given? Next slide, please. Now here, I must go down on my knees, and it's difficult getting back up and say, I have been a petrol head 
all my life. In fact, the press call me the Lamborghini. <laughs> um, so when I was interviewed oh, 18 months ago by the media at the in unveiling of Honda's Formula um, One car, the Earth car, it was absolutely rubbish, it didn't go at all. But I was there, and, all, and that funny man from, what's he called, he thinks he's out no, motor cars. Top Gear, like, he was there, he wouldn't speak to me. Because, of course, I am the president of the camping caravanning club, and he doesn't like... <laughs> <laughs> and I, I went up and I thanked him. He wouldn't listen. I said, thank you very much. To actually make them fall to pieces, you had pulled all the guts out, the inside, and then race them around the phone. You have get done the best advert for, um, you know, camper vans. And he didn't think that was funny, but so... Um, <laughs> I'd like to go on the program because I have been a... I had my first motorbike when I was 11. <laughs> and the police in London, you say, how's the bike going on, Dave? What would they say to me today? Probably, how's the bike going on, Dave? <laughs> There's some, still some good ones there. Yeah. Um, now, um, so I intone that Honda hopes that this magnificent machine is the most efficient one in the world to do the job it was built to do. There it is. The only thing green about it was it had no adverts on the front. It had a picture of the world with all those fluffy, funny clowns. The bit the media latched onto was my statement that it was my considered opinion that Formula One racing is a better mother of invention than Tony Blair's next war. And I really shouldn't have said that, shall I? <laughs> but, he, but he got all over the press. Ladies and gentlemen, it is also my considered opinion that good science, good social science, and good civil engineering based on the common sense ethics of natural history, not boom and bust profit, backed by badly researched politically targets, and a parcel of rogues with their snout deep in the trough can solve all environmental problems. We have got to reinvent truthful um, science. I don't know how we're going to do it, but we've got to do it. And I think if we could get a few of those scientists here who are frightened, you can't but blame them for being frightened, to hear the, the cross-section of humanity in this room who really care and will back up, I think it could happen quite little. So join the multicolored renaissance and help your communities to stitch their lives and their landscape back into more biodiverse working order. That is why we are gathered here today. But time to recall, um, time to recap, and also time to say no to the scam of, cap of capping um, uh, carbon. Next slide. Back in the um, early 70s, I used to get my research papers on natural history and the balance of the biosphere regularly published in the journal Nature. I even made it onto the front cover of that august publication, the most important science uh, papers in the world. And I was only the second person ever to produce, ever to go on that, the first being Charles Darwin. And wow! <laughs> and when... <laughs> and my dad even said, wow, when he saw me. <laughs> Here is the front of the thing. Next slide, please. Nature, David Bolmy, girl with grass skirt, me with a lawnmower. <laughs> that was on the front of nature. They believed in me in those days. And the caption was, science is fun. My God, it used to be fun, didn't it? We used to hear about scientists doing things, solving problems, making it into a better world. Now the bastards aren't doing it. And there are so many who are so 
I got six um, very, very good. And they say, we'll give you all stuff, but don't ever mention our name. We couldn't put up with what was slung at us by our colleagues in Cambridge. Why, why did it happen? Uh, So there you are, that was, I should have retired at that point. <laughs> but I did make about 400 programs. And wasn't I lucky, I went around the world, I've probably been around over 200 times in my life. I've been one of those privileged people, I have a multicolored um, uh, partner adopted family and I've been married and happy for over 50 years. I mean, my God, you know, I've never done a day's work in my life. <laughs> I mean, it, if, if coming in here and having the privilege of talking to you is work, what? <laughs> the next slide. May I say to everyone who's been scared um, by the global warming and wind farm dogma of the last 30 years, take heart. Earth's climate has remained within the limits tolerated by life for seven, several billion years. During this time, the planet has experienced unimaginable volcanic events which liberated huge amounts of CO2. We have collided with extraterrestrial te objects which tri triggered either increase or decrease of temperature. And even the, gen the energy flow from the sun has altered over such a span of geological time. And yet, here we are. Life remains. The global temperature is well within life limits. Indeed, the present day is cooler than much of previous geological time. The next slide, please. And there is the latest of the thing. It's not warming. It's cooling, and it's cooling extremely rapidly. Yes, in the past seven and a half years, rapid surface atmospheric cooling, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, has continued. Meanwhile, the BBC continues to preach the warmer's doom and gloom amongst nations. The next slide, please. Our swallows were a fortnight late this year. Perhaps they've heard about RSPB energy. Ladies and gentlemen, wow! David, thank you so much.